Okay, welcome everybody. Good evening, good afternoon. We'll just give a few minutes. I can see my attendee list is populating rapidly. So we'll just give, um, you know, half a minute or so and then we will start the festivities. Okay, well, I'm, I am conscious of time. And so um, we are going to get started. Um, again, welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I am the Dean of Student Success for Yorkville University and Toronto Film School. And I am absolutely thrilled to have an opportunity to host um, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are in the world, um, kind of conversation I'm calling it, climate change, energy, energy conservation and career opportunities. And um, I'm, I'm pretty excited and, and I think we've got um, a relatively good turnout uh, this afternoon. So. With no further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers and then I'm going to monitor the Q&A panel just so that you know I have disabled the chat. Um, so although we appreciate any messages that are coming through around, you know, thanks and great ideas or whatever kind of comments, um, I have disabled the chat. It gets too challenging to manage both the chat and the Q&A. So I would encourage you to direct your questions using to the speakers using the Q&A panel. They're going to talk and present for about 40 minutes, and then we will open it up for questions. So um, we will take questions at the end. Uh, so in the meantime, I am pleased to introduce you to Peter Love, adjunct professor at York University, where he teaches courses on energy efficiency and sustainability. Peter is the author of a free online textbook called Fundamentals of Energy Efficiency, Policy Programs and Best Practices. As an expert in his field, Peter provides strategic and policy advice and holds current and past advisory and leadership positions on several corporate and nonprofit boards, including Efficiency Capital, International Solar Solutions, LightSpark, the Toronto 2030 District, the Royal Canadian Institute for Science and Rethink Sustainability. Um, Mr. Love was the previous Chief Energy Conservation Officer of Ontario and during the 70s, he was a team member of the first environmental non-governmental organizations in Canada Pollution Probe. This is the team that brought you Reduce, Reuse, Recycle, which we still use today. Peter, I've known you for a little while now, and I didn't even know that about you. So I was pretty excited. I thought that was, that was quite cool. Um, I'm also thrilled to bring you uh, Jeremy Dresner, who's a program specialist at Fortis, BC. And of course, not everybody on our session tonight might know what Fortis is. So um, Fortis, BC provides natural gas and electricity to just over 1.2 million British Columbians every day. So they're really important for us out here in BC. Um, Jeremy is running the energy specialist program. He provides uh, specialist analysis and thermal energy manager positions to the largest commercial government healthcare and education organizations in the province of British Columbia. These recruits find energy saving projects for buildings and execute them using Fortis BC incentives. Um, Jeremy runs the Energy Wise Network uh, with BC Hydro that actively supports energy saving campaigns across British Columbia. He's more than 12 years experience in energy efficiency and renewable energy products in the UK and Canada and has previously worked on grid scale solar and battery storage projects, which also sounds really cool. So Jeremy lives in Vancouver, so he's out here in BC with me where it's just after four. Peter is in Ontario where it's just after seven. Um, so Jeremy lives out here with his wife and baby daughter. Peter, Jeremy, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really interested in what you've got to say this evening and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Deidre, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, tuning in. We never know how many people are gonna show up for these. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and the kind words. The other thing I'll add is that um, I have five kids and, uh, and, they, and they've all been through various versions of career changes. And I know the challenges associated with young people looking for jobs. So um, uh, I'm, 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 this is not a subject that's foreign to me. So Jeremy, let's have the first slide and uh, we're gonna go through these. <clears throat> and I just uh, saying passing, I'm gonna speak fairly quickly. We've got a lot of material to cover. Um, some of it is background. Uh, these slides are available um, 
uh, uh, on the on the on the site. Um, so if you want to look at them in more detail and think about them and use them in any way, please do so. But we're going to go through some of the slides fairly quickly um, because I want to end up uh, getting making sure we have time for questions for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about climate change, a little bit about energy conservation uh, generally, and then uh, Jeremy is going to take over and talk about energy conservation in BC because BC is one of the real leaders here. You may not know that, but you're going to know that by the end of the night. Uh, we're going to talk about employment opportunities generally in Canada, and then uh, Jeremy's going to talk about employment opportunities in company, companies like Fortis, and then we'll end up with just some very brief comments on what you can do. So next slide, Jeremy. <clears throat> so I think I'm not going to go into, this is, we're not going to go into the details of it, but uh, the International Panel on Climate Change is quite conclusive. Uh, the global temperature is changing. Uh, it is us. Uh, it is carbon dioxide. Uh, the only debate that remains is how bad, how soon. Um, and that's why those, there's a bit of a bar there. <clears throat> but the debate is over about whether it exists or not. And the vast majority of Canadians and, and most people around the world now acknowledge that. Uh, next, next slide. Um, we can see here a, a heat map. Um, it's going to affect some parts of the world more than others. Um, the northern, far northern hemisphere, as you can see, is, is going to be hugely impacted. Um, that is not necessarily a good thing. When we've got permafrost and we got buildings that were built on what was solid ground because it was frozen, as that ground unfreezes, that building um, starts to topple and roads and bridges and infrastructure no longer exist, and that heat in the north could also end up releasing further methane that is currently trapped um, in, in the permafrost. So the changes are very large, very dramatic, um, and again, uh, quite important. Next slide. <clears throat> um, the, the IPCC looked at the impacts at different levels of warning on, on our food system, our water system, Ecosystem, ecosystem itself and the risk of, um, of uh, severe weather events. And not surprisingly, as it gets warmer, it gets worse. And, and there's, this chart actually indicates some of the things that people are expecting could happen at one degree, two degree. Um, the, the target is to reduce it by two, two degrees and if possible, 1.5. Um, and, and, and so that's the challenge. We've got a number in front of us, and it's going to be important for us to figure out how to do that. Next slide. So coming to Canada, it's, you know, although people, most people in Canada and around the world are aware of climate change, what they're not so aware of is where it comes from. It's all because we don't actually see greenhouse gases. We can't smell it. Um, you can't see it coming out of a smokestack. <clears throat> so it's a little bit vague, but one of the important numbers, and I think probably the most important number you're going to hear tonight, is 81% of Canada's anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are from the production and use of energy. <clears throat> so the, 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 there's other things that people do around the farm and some unusual industrial processes, but most of the greenhouse gas emissions that are made by us in Canada are from production and use of energy, 81%. So yes, there's another 19% we should think about, but my focus is on that 81%. That's a big number, um, and that's where you want to start. So that's what, the, that's what the focus of my work has been on energy policy, because it's driven by a concern about greenhouse gas emissions and, and climate change. Next slide, please. This is a very complicated slide. I'm not going to go through it in detail, it's called a same key chart. Um, I love charts that have a ton of information. And if you can't sleep one night, you can bring it up on your screen and follow it through. But what it's showing is on the left side is where our energy comes from. And then on the right side, how we use it in the transportation and heating. So it's quite complex. Uh, a lot of our energy uh, it's exported, as you can see. Um, but one of the most important things to look at is the yellow line, which is the, the yellow bar at the end, that's the useful energy. And the, the two gray bars on top of that are the wasted energy. So we're currently wasting about 60% about of our energy through various conversion processes. 
<clears throat> one of the worst, um, you can actually see if you dig down to it a bit, was transportation, where you can see a large amount of gasoline, uh, crude oil coming in to the transportation sector, and the amount of useful energy coming out is relatively small, that little bar at the bottom, that little yellow bar at the bottom, that's the useful part. The other 80% or more is wasted. Our internal combustion en engines are very inefficient. So when people say, well, how much energy could we actually save? A lot. Um, we will never have that number at zero. We have laws of thermodynamics that will prevent us from having zero energy loss, but 60% is a lot. Um, and we certainly need to find ways to reduce that. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So next slide. So some of you may remember, and, and if you don't, I encourage you to look up, there's a Martin Luther King, very famous American uh, speaker. Um, and he had a very famous speech uh, in Washington um, where he could have talked about the problems of, of a black person in America in the 60s, in the early 60s. And he could have made a lot of very strong comments about how difficult it was to be and what the segregation is and how unfair it was. And he could have, he could have told a nightmare story about being black in America. He didn't. He talked about a dream. He said he talked about having a dream about a, a country that would be united, that, that would do there would be no more racial injustice. He knew that would not happen tomorrow. Uh, he knew it would have not happened in his lifetime. And we still don't have it, but we are getting there. And one of the things I think is really positive about what Martin Luther talked about is he didn't talk about his nightmare. He talked about his dream. So it, it was the same message, but it was how do we get there? So I find the same discussion with, can be there with climate change. A lot of people can spend a lot of time on how bad the problem is. And they'll tell all their friends and neighbors and, and family um, how bad the problem is. And it's really bad. And it's a really bad nightmare. And, uh, and you just go on and on. And people eventually turn off. A lot of people turn off. They don't want to hear your nightmare. They want to hear your solution. So next slide, please. So that's what we're going to focus on, the two solutions. Now, there are two solutions. Um, one is, how do we get more energy that doesn't produce greenhouse gas emissions? And, and, and so there's a lot of talk in the media about pipelines, Keystone, uh, Trans Mountain, oil tanker traffic, LNG, tar sands, solar collectors, now the role of the National Energy Board. Lots of discussion on the supply side of energy. How do we get cleaner energy? Very little on the demand side. How do we use less energy in the first place? So that's why we're talking today about that second thing that not many of you really have thought about before. Most Canadians don't think of it. When they think of energy, they think, yeah, wind turbines, solar collectors, pipelines, tar sands. That, that's, that is energy. That's the supply side. But we want to talk about the demand side. How do we use less how do we get that 60% down? Next slide. <clears throat> and studies have said that energy efficiency is a huge potential. This is work that was done for the International Energy Agency um, uh, in, in, in Paris, looking at the, the world economy. How do we get to our 2030 target? Next slide. But there's challenges. <clears throat> there's three main challenges. This slide is blurry. Energy is hard to see. Energy conservation is hard to see. It's in walls. It's in mechanical rooms. Each of you are in a, in a home or in an office or somewhere. And it's hard to tell how any energy efficient that building is or that room you're in is because everything's hidden. So it's very hard to see energy and energy conservation. So unlike recycling, and, and we talked about the three R's at the beginning, Three hours were very visible. You could see them. You could you could touch it. You could feel it. You could carry the blue box down to your down to your curbside. You can see your neighbors participating. It's a very um, tactile visual experience. Energy conservation is not. It's it's hard to see. We don't touch it. Um, <clears throat> next slide. It's also hard to measure. Not impossible when you build a solar collector or a wind turbine. It's very clear how much energy you're producing. But when you do energy conservation, it's, you're, you're trying to figure out, well, what would have happened, and now I'm using less. So there's ways of doing it, and they, there are protocols to do it, and, it's all, and there's a whole profession around implementing those protocols. 
but it's not simple. It needs a bit of time and it needs people to figure out how much it has actually been saved to verify those energy savings. And that's a whole career opportunity that we're gonna talk about later. And then the third slide, yeah. So we've got all sorts of warnings about climate change from around the world, how bad it's gonna be. Uh, next slide. It requires all of us to be participating. This is both a challenge and an opportunity. This is not gonna be solved by governments alone. It's not just China's fault or America's fault. It's not big business, it's not labor, it's not people in their homes, it's not people with trucks, it's everybody. We all are part of this. We're all going to have to be, have to be part of the solution. So next slide. And we have, we have benefits of conservation I want to briefly touch on. They're called the three E's, employment, economy, and the environment. Energy efficiency is labor intensive. That's why we're going to talk about careers in energy because you need people to do energy efficiency programs and, and services. It's good for the economy because we're saving money. And of course, it's good for the environment because if you save energy, you don't have to burn it. You've, you've just saved that much that doesn't have to be burned. So it's, it's got a triple advantage in terms of the benefits to the society. Next slide. Now, I've talked pretty quickly. Um, I've given you some background and I, because I want to, and I want to have Jeremy talk a bit about Fortis because this is the BC story. And as I said, BC are real leaders in terms of their uh, work they do on energy efficiency. So Jeremy, over to you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Deirdre, for your lovely introduction there as well. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak a little bit about Fortis. And uh, Fortis BC is actually part of Fortis Inc, which is a Canadian company out of St. John's, Newfoundland, which uh, has uh, owns utilities across North America, is in fact the 14th largest utility across North America, and mostly on the electric side, we're actually on the uh, gas side. And there we go. Um, so yeah, there's there's a number of uh, yeah, as you can see, a number of different utility operations, uh, 9,000 employees and 3.3 uh, million customers and a lot of assets as you can see and who's Fortis BC well Fortis BC is the gas provider in in British Columbia that is all the parts in mauve the parts in green are our friends in BC Hydro who provide the electric and we provide the electric in the small area down there and uh yeah just, just giving you a little bit of background we've got um a lot of infrastructure that is how the company that is how the company makes money. It owns infrastructure. It owns the supply uh, on the electric side, but only owns the distribution on the gas side. And that's an important part that we will come to in a moment. So energy efficiency. Um, we have uh, a plan for reducing customers emissions by 30% by 2030. And to do that, we are following a number of different avenues, including tripling our investment in energy efficiency in homes, businesses, and industry, and <coughs> innovative energy projects in BC communities. So um, the department that I'm in is the Conservation and Energy Management Department. We've been running for more than 10 years. We've been um, incentivizing efficiency projects in, in uh, as it says, you know, residential and industrial and commercial um, properties in across the province and spending million, many millions of dollars per year to do so and saving many, many tons of carbon, as you'll see. Um, energy efficiency is just one of the four pillars of, our, of what we call the clean growth pathway. So I'm just gonna explain briefly what the other ones are. And uh, if there's any questions on those, you can come back. Um, so we're also uh, producing a lot of renewable natural gas, which is gas from landfills and gas which is put through um, an anaerobic digester uh, set up from organic waste or um, agricultural waste and it can be upgraded and put into pipes and being uh, used as regular gas it's obviously um, a lot cleaner than than getting natural gas out of the ground we are producing global LNG which is liquefied natural gas where you cool down gas very significantly it's then taking up a lot less space and it can be used in global shipping and it can also be used as a substitute for other fossil fuels around the world and we've 
sent more than 2,000 ships from our Tilbury dock out um, across the Pacific um, to areas in Asia to reduce emissions there. And we're also um, investing in electric vehicle charging infrastructure and doing compressed natural gas for vehicles. So there's really a few different routes here that we're going through. It's going to get us a 30% uh, reduction in customer emissions by 2030, but we're focusing on energy efficiency today. But it is worth noting all of those because there are many, uh, how should I put it, there are many routes within uh, the energy industry which can uh, prove to be fruitful careers. And uh, many engineers uh, work across different disciplines, but uh, it's worth saying. So, something you might be wondering in the first place, why would a gas company be doing energy efficiency anyway? It's not like a sweet company really wants people to eat less sweets. It's not like uh, any company really wants you to use less their product. Why would we do that? Good question, glad you asked. Um, it's, there's a number of reasons. The, it's something that the customers actually ask us for. So we've got good relations with our customers and they say, um, how can we be more efficient? How can we, how can we spend less money? We have uh, government uh, mandates, both federally and provincially on emission reductions. In BC, they're very stringent and we're doing our part to keep up with federal and provincial um, guidelines and, and trying to trying to keep up with those. Uh, it, I won't go into details on this, but just to say that the way that um, the way that the utility industry is structured, particularly for a company like Fortis BC, we are a private company, we are shareholder owned. And every decision we make, everything we spend money on, every asset we own, um, has to be approved by the Utility Commission and uh, shareholders are able to uh, get a fixed rate of return on every asset we put in, but it, everything's highly regulated. And shareholders are able to get a return on every dollar we invest in energy efficiency. So there is a financial motivation for our shareholders. Um, on the supply side, we run pipes all across the province. We have to store gas and we have to um, and transport gas and uh, ultimately maintain all that infrastructure. So the more efficient we are with the, with that, the less storage we have to do and the less cost we have to put into storing. So it, it helps us on the supply side. And most importantly, this is the way of reducing carbon emissions, which is the most important thing. And that's certainly why I get out of bed in the morning. That's why a lot of people work work in this, in this area. It's a very effective route to reducing our GHGs. And I just want to highlight that uh, you can see here the bar on the left is 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, 2020. You'll see we've increased the amount of emissions we've saved every year, and we're planning to increase it again this year. Um, a lot of things have happened in 2020 that nobody expected, as you'll understand, but uh, we are still currently on target to slightly increase the amount of uh, CO2 that we're saving. Um, we're very proud of our work in that area. We're going to get back to how we do it a bit later. <laughs> hand back to, uh, I'm going to hand back to Peter now. Great. So I'll talk a little bit now about generally careers in energy. Um, this is a report you might want to download, Current Job Trends and Future Growth, by an organization called Eco Canada. Um, they're mainly focused on envir you know, um, environmentally friendly um, jobs in the energy sector, but um, the, 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 in, and they're looking at the environmental subsector. But they, they've got some interesting stats here. So do you want my next slide? <clears throat> Peter, can I just, sorry, Peter, can I just interrupt you? We're getting a little bit of feedback on your mic, I think. I'm, I'm okay, but I'm getting some feedback from some of our attendees. I wonder if you could just um, move your chair back a little bit and okay. it might have sound quality. I, I'm better? not really sure. Um, like I say, I'm not having a huge problem um, hearing you, but but we're, I'm getting some messages. So maybe just a little bit farther back might help. I, I don't have sure. any, have any major thing I could do. Let me just try. Um, if this is better. Just hold tight, everybody. Is that any better? Um, I I think probably, but it, what I'll do is ask anybody that um, you know if anybody is in the Q and A can let me know whether that's better. And for the moment, Peter, I'll leave you to to carry on. There's not a lot we can do about sound quality when we're part way through, but I, I appreciate your headphones and hopefully that'll help. Okay. Thanks so much. Yep. So this is um, uh, uh, from that report. It's um, starting salaries, um, starting salaries, and average top salary. 
in, in different roles, uh, renewable energy project manager, um, energy engineer, energy manager. Now, typically these energy managers don't, do not need to be engineers. Um, many of them aren't. Green building product project manager, green building designer, energy efficiency program manager and project manager, and energy policy analyst. And these are business development marketing manager. So some are managerial positions, you need to work up to those, but some of them are, are more entry level. So it gives you a, a range of the, the type of positions that, that are available. Um, next slide there, Jeremy. This is the employment areas, um, manufacturing and big green building design, construction, engineering, and retrofitting. Um, and these represent about 87% of the energy workforce. Um, most energy professionals work as corporate energy professionals, design professionals, and implementers. So there's, again, some are, some are gonna be technical engineers, but many are not. And and typically what I find with uh, with engineers is that they do, and Jeremy's not an engineer either, and neither am I. Engineers can be very good at technical things. Sometimes they have trouble expressing their ideas, getting their ideas uh, accepted by others. Maybe Deidre, you're an engineer, I don't know. <laughs> um, but sometimes they, they, they need help in, in, in making the business this case in, in understanding um, how it should actually work and dealing with real people. So that's something that, uh, that uh, people with an arts background can be very good at. So uh, I see some chuckles. So <laughs> hope that hit, hit a tune. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of skills, a majority, 75% of energy professionals hold at least a bachelor's degree, 7% an advanced degree, such as a master's or a PhD. 60% um, of uh, have four or more years of experience, only 5% less than one year. So um, that's not surprising that would be typically for most industries. <clears throat> and as I said, people need both technical and business skills and top technical skills um, include developing sustainable development indicators, plans and strategies. That's not an engineer's job. That's someone who understands what's going on. Uh, Lazing and partnering with stakeholders. Again, that's not an engineer. Developing, coordinating, implementing energy efficiency programs. Some of the implementation is an engineer, uh, but a lot of it isn't. And then conducting environmental assessments. Again, in, you know, it, engineering is part of that, but there's much more socio-technical evaluations well beyond engineering. So that gives you a broad scope of, of the, the type of positions could be around. Next slide. Um, some employment stats, this is from Natural Resources Canada. Um, there were about um, 282,000 people directly employed in the energy sector and another 550,000 indirectly. Um, that's people that live in energy communities or support the industry. 10% um, of our, our GDP um, uh, revenues, uh, almost almost $20 billion in 2018, uh, more than $1.1 billion spent on energy research development and deployment. Um, and the Canada is the sixth largest exporter and the fourth largest net exporter um, uh, and the eighth uh, largest consumer of energy in the world. So Canada is a major player. We've got major resources in uranium, oil, gas, uh, hydroelectricity. Um, we are major consumers. We are major users in our industry. <clears throat> so we have a major role to play in, in moving forward. Next slide. So I'll turn it back over to Jeremy. So how do we do it? Um, I would explain how uh, we do it here at Fortis BC. And uh, we have a program which I run called the Energy Specialist Program. And we recruit energy specialists for all the largest commercial organizations in the province. And we have incentives for energy efficiency equipment. And that's um, one of the primary ways that Fortis BC is able to really move the needle on efficiency projects in BC. Um, so I run the Energy Specialist Program. We've created um, we've created two new positions this last year. So Energy Specialists uh, generally have a Certified Energy Manager qualification. Um, you don't have to be an engineer to get that. Uh, but you will need some experience in the industry. And these guys uh, are able to be comfortable in a, in, a, in a boiler room and looking at equipment, understanding what they're looking at, understanding a little bit about uh, heating and cooling, the interactions between the two, 
and find opportunities for efficiencies. But it's not just that, it's also about, um, put, as Peter said, you know, putting a business case together, getting stakeholders, other people in the organizations to buy in. You're always up, uh, asking for budget. You're always asking for budget that other people are also asking for. So there's always competing priorities and you're one of your skills as uh, an energy specialist is to be able to, to make the case that the project should be prioritized. That, as has already, already been alluded to, is not always an engineering skill. So it's a real mixed skill set there. Um, we now have energy analysts as well, and they um, take a little bit more of a holistic view of um, an organization's uh, portfolio of buildings. Perhaps they're doing surveys asking. We have one, for example, at BC Nonprofit Housing who's surveying a thousand nonprofit housing uh, sites across the next two years and is coming back with with information on on, on what they their thoughts on energy and, and doing that that sort of work um, and we have others who are completing surveys amongst hotels and amongst uh, tourist association areas and uh, we also have thermal energy managers and these guys are both doing their experienced bunch and they're doing the strategic side and the uh, technical side as well and a lot of these guys will work directly within facility management teams of their organizations. Um, and you might be wondering how you fit in. Well, we're looking for more people too. What does an energy specialist actually do? Um, they increase the participation in rebate programs. So we, as I said, give out uh, millions of dollars a year to, to organizations to do efficiency projects. Exactly how that those should be spent and how that should be targeted needs somebody on the ground who can work out the right order of things, work out what projects should be done this year, next year, and for the next five years, and what's gonna have the best carbon impact for the money spent. Um, so that's all, it's all the job of a specialist. And um, find opportunities for natural gas, conservation and efficiency, and um, be part of an energy management team. Um, specialists will generally use, I'm just, to, I'm just gonna sort of explain very briefly what they do. You buy a piece of equipment, you submit an application for a rebate and uh, we'll review it and then we we pay a check and a specialist will will do that program other people who are non-specialists of course can also can also participate in our programs but that's that is the job of a specialist finding opportunities submitting applications and getting getting money from us to them and uh, these are just some of the examples of the kind of uh, areas where we provide rebates um, and uh, yeah, it's all kinds of things you'll find around a building. Some of them are a little bit specialist, like an ice rink deaerator. Um, but uh, so a lot of them are very standard and we're always looking to increase the number of uh, incentives that we provide as a company, um, including, and this is um, a fund that I am lucky enough to administer that's exclusively for specialists. We do a gas technology demonstration program. And this is the overview, as it says, uh, we offer up to 80% of funding to do studies and 75% to do technology demonstrations and 75% for monitoring and evaluation, which is what Peter was talking about before. And this is an opportunity for energy specialists to try out new things, to try out things that aren't um, within our rebates. It works for them because the organization gets a new piece of equipment. It works for us because we get to monitor it and see whether these products actually do what the manufacturer claims that it'll do. And if they do, we'll be able to have fund those on an ongoing basis through rebates um so there's something in it for everyone uh and that's a, it's a really exciting bit of our program job growth alert um this is just the um our own team so i i've been part of the uh fortis bc team here since um since 2018 when we had 35 employees and we now have 53 employees um We've had huge growth and this is uh, with COVID as well. And this is people administering um, incentives on the residential, commercial and industrial sides, um, as well as doing some of those technology innovation pieces. And um, again, on the energy specialist program that I run, um, we've had, we had 26 energy specialists when I started. And uh, as of today, we now have 38 um, energy positions because we've got those two new positions as well. So that's basically what I've been doing all year is a lot of contract work, a lot of recruiting, a lot of onboarding and a lot of getting uh, new folks signed up. But it really does speak to um, the, the, the growth in the industry. And uh, I can I can really 
uh, speak to what Peter was saying before. It is not just engineers that we're employing either. Um, just, uh, yeah, you're obviously coming from uh, across Canada there, but some of these organizations may may resonate. Um, all of these organizations have an OMG specialist um, and uh, these ones too. Um, and a few more that I haven't had time to put on the slides because they're coming in thick and fast. So um, yeah, these are large organizations that uh, you'll see that all the health organizations and universities that, that a lot of them have really key um, commitments to energy efficiency, to carbon reductions, and they need more hands on deck to make it happen. And that's what we're providing. Back to Peter. Unmute. Uh, we're just about at the end here. Um, and as I said, we, we wanted to talk to you about what you can do um, as, as students and as uh, potentially future homeowners, and maybe some of you already are, or and certainly as employees. And you may or may not be in the energy sector, um, but you're going to be making important decisions about how you live and, and the impact that way of life has on, on our climate and on the environment. Um, I was often asked for a list of things that, that people should do. Uh, and I was reluctant. Um, um, I just, uh, I, I, it's sort of continuous improvement. I'm still doing new things. Um, there's always something to learn. There's always something to do. But I kept on being asked for, you know, a list. Um, some people say, give me 10 things and I just want to knock them off and be done or give me 50. So I've actually, um, I came back um, and my team came back and we came up with a list of three things. So. Um, they're not easy, um, and the first is probably the most important and the most difficult, and the first is to think. Think about energy when you make your purchase decisions, when you make your life decisions. Don't become overly obsessed with it, but just stop and think about, about it when you buy a car or you decide to take transit or you're going to um, we set your thermostat or you're looking at buying a new TV set or looking at buying a new phone, just among other things, Think about the energy implications of it. The information's there. You're all very smart. You can all go online. You can all see you know, how much energy different products use. There's some labeling. Um, when you buy a home, you can find homes that are more energy efficient than other ones and heating systems and appliances. But the first thing and probably the most important thing is to think about it and stop and think because so much of what we do, because energy, we don't see it, we just default to whatever's easiest. So that's the first thing is to think. The second, do you have a slide, is to believe that when you do something, it will make a difference. And it's very easy to say, well, you know, over in India and China, they're building power plants and we got Donald Trump in the States and he's making a mess and Putin doesn't really seem to care about climate. Why should I bother doing anything? I'm such a large, small piece of the pie. But it, it, it's important because we all can make a difference. Canada has, is a, a world leader, has won international awards for its blue box program, the recycling program. It's not perfect, but it's the best in the world um, as, a, as, a, as appointed, as, as, uh, as found by the UN. Because people believe, they said, you know, I'm gonna put my stuff out. I don't know what happens to it. And sometimes they may throw it in the garbage, but I'm gonna do this. And it was really kids and maybe some of you when you were younger, Bug their parents, say, mom, get with a program. It's not that hard. Dad, this is not what you do. So we need to believe that when you do something, it can make a difference. And we've seen this. It has made a difference. And the third thing is to act. This is not theoretical. Don't leave it up to governments. Uh, I've worked with government agencies. You do not want to have the governments control all this. You do need to take action yourself. And, and uh, when some of you might recognize Rosie the Riveter um, during the Second World War, um, where women played a huge part in, in mobilizing um, the, uh, the war effort in Canada and the States and Britain. Um, but actually do it. And and, uh, uh, and 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 learn from it and do it again and maybe do it better the next time. So those are the three things that I, I ask you to do. And I've got one final slide here. What we're talking about is a culture of conservation. It's just it's a different way of thinking about energy, and it's the way to. And it again, it's not the only thing you think about, but it should come to you second nature. 
And it, it sounds sort of vague, but we've actually done this before. And, and in my lifetime, I've seen major changes. I've seen I've talked about the Blue Box program. <clears throat> um, uh, Seatbelts. Yes, there's legislation, but there were police everywhere. People sort of caught on, and you don't like the noise it makes if you don't do it up anyway. But people now, there's huge compliance levels with seatbelts, and that was unheard of in the 70s. Um, drinking and driving and having a designated driver, huge changes in the last 20 years. Um, yes, again, the police, there's regulatory there, but police can't monitor everybody. And I know from my kids, uh, and their friends, they're much more responsible about making sure that if they're drinking, they are not driving or there's a designated driver. And the third one is non-smokers rights. I was very involved with that. And again, it didn't change in five years. So it was depressing and it, it looked like nothing would move, but it was less than 20. So these, these are major changes that we've seen. And, and just on that note, I'll give a personal story. I, I, you can see that I'm not young. young. Um, I did a degree in math and math physics chemistry and an MBA. And I never had it, I never took psychology. And yet I've been in the energy field for my career, encouraging people to think, believe and act and looking and developing programs. And I began more and more interested in why people make the decisions they do. Uh, and how do I, how, do, how can we best influence those decisions? And it's an area of psychology. And some of you may be taking psychology but it's an area I knew very little about. So I actually went back last year and I was one of 1,500 people at University of Toronto, took Psychology 100. Um, everybody in the class was 18. Uh, they were very smart. Uh, they all wanted to be med students. Uh, many of them will be. Um, and this and coming up in, in January, I'm taking a second year course on social psychology. And after I do that, I'm going to be taking a fourth year course on environmental psychology. Um, so there's a lot, it's a huge amount that can be learned from non-technical people. And I'm, as I said, I'm going back to university to, to better understanding the human dimensions of it. All of you uh, are, are going to be much younger than I am. I'm sure you're going to be much better at social media and, and way, the modern new ways of communicating with people. Um, there's huge opportunities for us to, to motivate behavior. So with that, I think we're at our, our, at our 40 minutes. Um, there's how to contact me and Jeremy. Uh, you can call, send me an email and there's Jeremy's and there's Jeremy's email as well. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll stop here and, and uh, hope that you've uh, saved up some questions for us. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Peter and Jeremy. That was that was fantastic. And, and um, if I may, perhaps I'll just share for everybody how I came to be involved in this because some people might be saying, well, what the heck am I doing here? But um, as former Dean of Academics for the British Columbia campus, I oversaw the, the Bachelor's of Business Administration with the Energy Manager Specialization or Energy Management Specialization, which is how, Peter, you and I came to, to be introduced. So, you know, they're, they're, I'm hoping that there's some BBA with Energy Management Specialization students watching, but, um, you know, there may also be some BBA students that haven't declared a specialization. And I was always surprised, given all of the information Peter and Jeremy that you shared today and the incredible opportunity that this, you know, the, this broad sector has, I was always surprised that it was our least popular. Um, and I think Peter, you and I've talked about this before. It's our least popular um, area of specialization. And yet the opportunity, the salaries that you've shared, if you look at Jeremy, just the hiring that you've done in, in this year during COVID, which, you know, there was lots of organizations that were having hiring freezes. It's, I think it really shows the amount of of opportunity that exists in the sector and and that you don't all have to be engineers. I think that was a really important message that I heard today was that there's a lot of kind of the although no disrespect to engineers intended. I, th I think we might have mocked the engineers a little bit. We need them. We need them. Absolutely. <laughs> we, need them. we absolutely need them. <laughs> But there's, but there, there is a language that they speak, and and you know we also need the people on the business side that can really get out there and the same as you two do, and and talk to stakeholders and really get all of that buy-in and and have those cultural shifts, which which is you know when I think about all the things that we used to do, just as a you know just as the questions are, are starting to come in, um, I remember not that long ago when we didn't recycle kind of home use plastics, you know, the, the saran wrap that we used and all that sort of stuff. And my husband and I commented not that long ago that now that our recycling program in our community, 
takes, you know, that now that we can recycle that sort of stuff or however that kind of all happened, um, I am amazed at how much plastic that we used to throw in the trash. So, you know, it doesn't, it hasn't taken that much to, you know, the first time when we started doing this, it was like, you know, what a pain this is, but now it's just nothing, none of that stuff goes in the garbage. So I think, Peter, that's what you were talking about in terms of, it becomes small, small things that we all do individually that makes it different collectively that that also causes this shift of culture now i can't even imagine th you know throwing that stuff in the garbage it's, yeah. i I, yeah. I just i just admitted it live on youtube but anyways i'm sure i'll be <laughs> forgiven <laughs> Oops. so let, let's see um uh okay we've got a first question here so everybody start, start using the the q a panel to send questions um so this is interesting. Since animal agriculture has an undeniable impact on climate change. Um, oh, so it's more of a comment. I hope we start including our diet choices and consider eating more plant based foods when we think about what we can do as individuals to reduce our carbon footprint. So Peter, we hear about this a lot that it's not right. just um, you know, our cars, but it, it's kind of, a, there's a lot of things that impact our, um, you know, our carbon footprint. It, so what, what's your thoughts? Does farming have that big of a, um, an impact? It, it does. It does have an impact, um, especially, uh, especially cows, more than, more than pigs, more than dairy, um, more than chickens, uh, cows, because of their digestive system and the methane they get off, um, Cow farts and 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 it's actually burping a lot of burps. Um, so yeah, yeah. it's a lot. Um, so one of my sons is gone vegetarian for that reason alone. I just he's he doesn't eat oh, wow. meat. Just that's because. And I think most people. Um, I mean, I couldn't go that far, but I certainly eat less. I mean, you you all of you know. Again, I'm, I think about it. I'm aware of it. Um, smaller portions and and not not have meat as often. Um, certainly, I'll have fish fairly more often than I used to. Um, so yes, it it, it does. It's um, people have um, broken it out, um, and that's that that the. Um, the cows would represent a good chunk of that 19% that's not energy. Um, so at the agricultural sector is around 15% of that 19, and a lot of that is uh, is digestion. So, uh, you, you know, the people are coming up with uh, different types of additives for food that would mean that uh, cows um, burp less. Um, uh, if they are use, uh, eating, you know, grass only, maybe that has an impact. So I think it's something that people are going to work on. And, and, and some people, as I say, will make the decision just to say, I'm going vegetarian. But most people, I think, would look to stay, at least reduce the amount of, um, uh, especially beef that they eat. Yeah. Right, right, right. I'll say, I'll say something else as well. There's, uh, um, there's uh, you know, a lot of new options for uh, Beyond Meat and things like that. You can get A&W now. Um, first, yeah. the first non-meat burger was created in a lab was cost $300,000 plus. That was in 2011. Uh, oh. Two years ago, they cost, they cost $11. So that's how quickly that has progressed. And now they're very slightly more expensive than regular, uh, regular burgers. So the progress on that front has been amazing. And I'll just do just one thought as well. There's absolutely no reason why uh, Beyond Burgers or Impossible Burgers or any of these new types of burgers should stop at the point that beef tastes here. If they're catching up to exactly how beef tastes, why would they stop there? They can keep going beyond and taste even better than that. So, so <laughs> at that point, cows are in, cows are in trouble. So um, I'll, leave, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> uh, the, I, I, th I think the cows might be pretty happy to no longer be on the menu, but you know, <laughs> we, can, we can maybe survey them later, right? Um, so being a, so another question has popped in, being a student, what can I contribute to gain experience and gain more knowledge to um, pursue my, my career in the field of specialization? So it sounds like might be an energy management student. So what, what are some things that students can do while they're in their program? So um, I'll start off again, and, and uh, I'd encourage you to volunteer uh, with, a, uh, with a group, uh, either at, at the university or in the community, um, to, and there's all sorts of opportunities there. Um, 
the, the other opportunity sometimes is to volunteer with an existing organization uh, to help them with their conferences or their newsletters or their mailings or whatever. And some of the jobs may be pretty menial, you know, licking envelopes and giving out badges but at the reg registration table, but it means that you're meeting people. Um, you're often invited to attend the, the, um, uh, the full proceedings. Um, and it's a way to get to know people in the industry and to get a sense of it. Um, so I, th and, and of course the, the thing people always talk about is networking and that comes easier to some people than to others. Uh, I know that, um, but you do need to get out and talk to people. Um, and, uh, sometimes it's someone that you, you know, you never would have thought, um, would lead to something and they they sometimes do i formed a company uh, and found my partner through talking to a cousin who had nothing to do with my business um i just said this is what i'm sort of looking for this is the sort of person i'm looking for and he introduced me to someone and we formed a business and and uh which has become successful and or uh, remain good friends so networking volunteering uh the third thing i'll say is when you do do a resume uh, you submit it make it perfect Perfect, perfect. Not even close to a typo, not even close to being a template. Don't bother throwing something in. Don't bother. Um, uh, people like Jeremy can see a thrown in resume. Think about it, go on the website, customize your covering letter, uh, take time and, and try to get yourself noticed. It's hard, but the last thing, people like Jeremy are going to be they'll use by resumes. And the first thing they can, they'll look for is form letters, typos, mm -hmm. you know, messy. Just make sure you make that first cut. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really, really sound advice, Peter. I, I, I'd uh, add a couple of things there. And, and, and when you do the volunteering, do make sure you put it down in your resume. It shows that you, that you actually care, that you're committed, that uh, people who look at resumes do notice that. That does make a difference. Um, LinkedIn is your friend. Um, I, I, I call uh, getting 500 uh, connections on LinkedIn, completing LinkedIn, because at that point it just says 500 plus. Um, and as Peter says, you never know when connections are going to lead to opportunities and you find that out by talking to people. And uh, two, uh, two cheap tips from my own experience. One, if you see an organization um, that has just hired a new manager, for energy or something that's above your pay grade, contact uh, contact the uh, the person who's doing the who's who's in charge of that recruitment. That's how I got my first job. Actually, um, I saw that they were hiring a manager. I said, "Okay, you're hiring a manager. Maybe you need somebody um, more junior as well." Because suddenly, that part of the company that's doing efficiency has got a lot of a lot of money, has got a lot of interest. So it's quite possible that they're looking for new people. And uh, if you've already got your resume through, that makes their life easier. So that's one cheat. The second cheat, um, you know, not all, not all jobs are listed on Indeed or whatever. Um, if you email a director, um, it might be annoying for them, but they may just pass it down to the right person. I, if I get an email from, from my director and it says, okay, this person's emailed me with a CV, I'm always looking at that CV with particular interest. So yeah, yeah. they've kind of gone around the system. They've kind of cheated, but what have you yeah. got? Why not? Uh, so <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because of course, as, as somebody that runs career services for Yorkville University, like these are the messages we tell students all the time. Customize your resume. Yes, write a cover letter and put effort into it. Allow yourself to shine. Manage your social media and do not rely on Indeed for job for jobs, right? Like it really is that that nurture your network and, and make meaningful connections. And so I, I am so grateful that you two said that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is you know out here in British Columbia we do have clean energy BC so you know Peter was talking about networking volunteering at conferences and those sorts of things so clean energy BC is an organization that you know our local students um, you know might want to at least have a have a look at obviously with COVID things have, have have changed a lot but we will get back to to you know actually having in in in-person conferences and things like that so another uh, question has come in as a student can I get any certifications before getting um, a bachelor's degree? And if yes, what would those be? Jeremy, do you want to start that one? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of online, I mean, as well as the volunteering, which I really can't recommend highly enough. There are a bunch of online courses that you can take um, in specialized areas. So for example, my, I have a background in solar and there's solar industry associations and they'll have uh, online courses and particular uh, qualifications. And uh, yeah, it might, it, might be, it might be a couple of hundred dollars, but it would look, it, the value it would add to your CV will likely outweigh the, the cost if it's an area you really want to get into. So I can't speak for every niche area, but if you've got a particular interest, like it, it's, it's worth signing up and getting, doing an online course or, or something, something like that. In addition to you, in addition to your studies, well, just to add, uh, I agree, and and uh, it, 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 there's a number of lead certification you can get, um, uh, and there's different ones. Um, uh, I just was online today. Uh, I'm taking a course. Um, I'm interested in in working on boards, and I've done some. I've got a, a, a diploma, but I'm. Uh, for from the Institute of Corporate Directors, but I'm taking a, a new course out of um, out of the U.S. out of a law school at UC Berkeley, and it's on the role of boards in ESG, uh, environment, social, and governance governance, um, and it's the board's role. So yeah, I'm online, um, and I'll end up with um, a certification um, that it, it means that. You know, I'm, I'm, it, it shows that you've got an interest in the subject. It shows that you're interested in continuous improvement. And as I said, even someone at my age, um, um, and I maybe need more improvement than others. So um, I'm always looking for opportunities to to learn and to, um, to network and to improve my skills. Um, that's, that's great. So we're just, I think, nearing the end. Um, We've had a question come in that, that I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I was going to ask it, pri um, answer privately because I'm not sure that either of you, you might be able to answer it, but um, so just the students wondering, it sounds, so it sounds like an international student here um, and once they complete their bachelor's degree, what can I exactly do holding my work permit? And um, I don't know if either of you want to tackle that, but, you know, my understanding and, and my information is, is you know, I'm, I'm not one of our, our people that would guide our international students is, you know, I think almost any work is available to them once they have a work permit. I, that's my understanding, Do Jeremy, do you know, do you have any experience? <laughs> my, that's my understanding, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. Yeah, your, your work permit is your work permit. So, you know, if... Um, and uh, once you complete your bachelor's degree and you have your postgraduate work permit, you know you should be able to work work anywhere, and um, for as long as your work permit is is available. And so I think that that what's really interesting is that you know we have both domestic and international students that are quite interested in you know in energy management. As a matter of fact, my understanding the last I looked is that our BBA in energy management has more international students than it does domestic students. Um, so there's a real, um, you know, this is a this is a global conversation, isn't it, around energy and energy conservation and, and energy management and what you know different municipalities and, and countries around the world are doing for from the for this. So I think I think the majority of new energy specialists that have started this year um, come from outside of Canada, and they oh. gained gained quali Canadian qualifications, but uh, were born outside of Canada. So. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of opportunities. Right, right, interesting. And at one point I had heard from a, a mutual colleague, Peter, um, that um, the, the plan at, at one point was that every municipality, at least in British Columbia, if not across the country, wanted to have an energy manager that worked yep. for the municipality around there. So that would be things like their, their buildings, perhaps fire halls, um, you know, kind of any municipal building that that the municipality owned and ran it could be swimming pools that they wanted an energy manager um an employee that was an energy manager and so i think and, and yeah that. you're right and bc is a leader there um the other thing that the other trend that's happening um in bc and it was started here in ontario 
sort of on hold now is community energy plans. So it's one thing for BC Hydro or Fortis to have a province-wide plan, but a lot of communities want their own plan. We, we, you know, right. the, 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 the municipal buildings and we got skating rinks and we got, you know, roads and they want to have their own plan. They want to set their own targets. A lot of them have declared a climate emergency and now they want to follow up and say, okay, what is it I can do? So again, they're looking for a staff to actually, you know, be that energy, you know, uh, online energy manager and for us and, and, and BC Hydro provide funding for help with that, but also then to have a strategic plan, an energy plan, what we are, what, what's our target in 30 years and how are we going to get there? Right. Perfect. Okay. Well, I, I think that we could probably carry on this conversation. <laughs> it's quite fascinating for a while, but our, our time has come to an end. I want to remind all of our, attendees here that we did live stream on YouTube. So if you want to rewatch it, if you want to uh, grab the slide that has uh, Jeremy and Peter's email addresses, they just so generously, you know, put out there for you, then, you know, you can look at it that way. If you want to reach our offices, career services at yorkvilleu.ca, and, you know, we'd be happy to help you navigate some of this, get your resumes going, um, help you with your LinkedIn profiles. And at one point, our energy manager, um, BBA, had a relationship with Fortis. So, Jeremy, you and I might want to connect uh, afterwards okay. to see if that, uh, that relationship still exists, because it's been a few years since I've looked at it. In the meantime, thanks to all of our attendees and my deepest thanks to you, Peter, and to you, Jeremy, you. for your time uh, this you, afternoon and this evening. I, I think it was great. Um, I still look forward to, you know, maybe doing this again. And I, I understand that, that hopefully you'll become um, some regular guest lecturers to, to some of hey. our students. So I, I think it's that. a really important message. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you gave us your time this evening. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. It's getting pretty late for you, Peter. But <laughs> Jeremy looks like he's still at the office. So. <laughs> thank you. Thanks,